very warm welcome uh, for those of you who it's your first appearance at the Edinburgh Book Festival, in which case, why haven't you been to other events? But anyway, um, my name's Liz Leonard, and I'm really pleased to be chairing uh, today's event, marking 100 years of remarkable women in Parliament. Uh, it's part, this session, of the festival's Telling Your Story series, celebrating bold, defiant, revolutionary women. Uh, and certainly, the women that were Rachel's going to talk about are no exception. When Rachel Reeves was elected MP for Leeds West in 2010, she was only the second woman to serve as an MP for the city, but she quickly realized that she knew very little about the first woman to represent Leeds, Alice Bacon. Despite Alice serving as an MP from 1945 to 1970, and then in the House of Lords until her death in 1993, Rachel discovered there was no biography of her. That started Rachel on a journey, which brings her here today with her second book, Women of Westminster. And it's my real pleasure to welcome you to Edinburgh, Rachel. Thank you. Um, the format of today's session, so everybody's clear, um, I'm shortly going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to talk to us for about 20 minutes. I'll be monitoring the time. Oh, even better, there's a clock straight behind me. Um, and she's going to read some extracts as well. I'll then ask her a couple of questions before inviting you, the audience, to put forward any questions or comments that you have, so do store them up. Um, I need to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, Rachel's going to be signing her book in the, I love this, the gin tent, I don't know whether we get gin. Um, <laughs> it's the gin tent and cafe bar, which is, uh, must be that way, I think, if my, I've got my uh, directions right, basically towards the entrance um, after the event. And um, I'll mention this at the end later. If you've got further questions or points that you want to put to Rachel, if you could possibly hold on to those and actually go and have a chat with her at the signing tent because there's other things coming on in, in, in this venue. Um, mobiles, switch to silent uh, or turned off. And uh, if you're a tweeter, I've been asked to um, ask you not to start tweeting until the lights come up um, because it's apparently distracting. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. So some background. Now, Rachel and I maybe will have a comment in the, from the audience afterwards um, uh, because I did some research and the current, I came up with, this was allegedly at July 2019. Unfortunately, I haven't put the source, but the current number of female MPs is 210. Rachel, I was checking that with her this morning and she thinks it might be 211. But despite that, um, uh, whatever it is, this still represents under a third of the total. Um, so the battle for parliamentary equality in the UK is far from won. And as of last month, I was reading the UK sits 39th, I thought that was really appalling, in the International League table for the proportion of women in its parliament. A long way behind, and this I found fascinating, in first, second and third places are Rwanda, Cuba and Bolivia. Um, women MPs have been the driving force behind huge social and economic reform over the last hundred years. Rachel will be touching on that in her um, and the, those achievements, which have broadly gone completely unremarked, and credit has not been given where, where credit is due. And when I read your book, Rachel, um, I wasn't surprised at the experience of those early female parliamentarians, like the first one to take her seat in 1919. I love this quote, Nancy Astor, when Winston Churchill told her, I find a woman's intrusion to the House of Commons as embarrassing as if she burst into my bathroom when I had nothing to defend myself, not even a sponge. 40 years later, uh, in the 1960s, you report that Shirley Summerskill, a minister in Harold Wilson's government, had her hair stroked by a male MP who stopped her in a corridor but she couldn't report his behavior to the whip's office because the culprit was, in fact, the chief whip himself, Bob Mellish. But today, in 2019, it's still going on. Sexism, um, being patronized, uh, in some cases, blatant discrimination. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you and, as it were, putting some women in the focus that we've not heard of at all.
Well, th thank you very much, um, Liz. When Winston Churchill made those remarks to Nancy Astor uh, about um, a woman walking into his bathroom with nothing to defend himself but a sponge, and Nancy Astor retorted, you're not good-looking enough to have such concerns, Winston. Uh, <laughs> I like to think that all of us would come up with a reply that good uh, if we were put down by uh, a, a man uh, in that way. Um, Nancy Astor also uh, said that um, pioneers are often picturesque figures, but they're also very lonely ones. And I think that they, that was her experience um, in those early years being the only woman in Parliament. This story, uh, uh, the story in this book, really starts in, in 1918. In February 1918, the Act of Parliament was passed that women could um, vote in general elections. Six weeks before the general election, in that year, 1918, a very short act of parliament was passed, which gave women the right to stand as MPs in that election. But because it was just six weeks before the general election, most of the political parties had already selected candidates for their uh, seats, particularly in the most winnable seats. So it was incredibly difficult for a woman to succeed in that 1918 general election being elected as a member of parliament. And indeed, the only woman who was elected in that 1918 general election was Constance Markovitz. And she was a candidate for the Sinn Féin party. So as is the tradition of that party, she didn't take her seat in the House of Commons. Uh, she was actually in prison for high treason at the time, so even if she had wanted to take her seat, it might have been somewhat tricky. So a year later, in November 1919, um, Nancy was elected, but in many ways she was an accidental member of Parliament. Her husband, Wardorf Astor, was the member of Parliament for Plymouth Sutton, and his father was in the House of Lords, and he died suddenly, and Wardorf was his eldest son, and so Wardorf inherited his father's seat in the House of Lords. Now, he didn't want to be in the Lords, he wanted to be in the Commons, so he wanted to relinquish his seat in the Lords and return to the Commons, so he had to find a stopgap candidate to stand in Plymouth Sutton to keep the seat warm for him for his return. So he asked his wife, Nancy, to stand, and she did, and she served as the Member of Parliament for Plymouth Sutton from 1919 to 1945. Uh, a very long <laughs> stopgap, and Wardoff never returned to the House of Commons. There were so many issues that those early women in Parliament, Nancy Astor and then uh, uh, women like um, Margaret Wintringham, Margaret Bonfield, Ellen Wilkinson and others had to, uh, had to deal with and contend with. Uh, it's certainly the case that the parliamentary authorities, as well as the male MPs like Winston Churchill, were not that keen on having women there in the House of Commons. In many ways, they were breaking up the, uh, the cosy all-male club that had existed in Westminster so, for so many hundreds of years. And Nancy Astor said that her colleagues would have rather have had a rattlesnake in the House of Commons rather than her. And I think she was almost certainly correct in that. Even the parliamentary authorities didn't know what they were going to do with these women if they got elected. And so in 1918, they created a room in Parliament called the Lady Members Room, where the women MPs were expected to do their casework, write their speeches, often sleep, because uh, at that time, you still had regular all-through-the-night uh, sittings. But Perhaps predictably, the lady members' room was located down two flights of stairs, about of a quarter of a mile from the debating chamber. And it was quickly nicknamed by the early women in Parliament as the dungeon. And so again, you get a, a sense of the surroundings in which the women had to do their work. There was also the question of what women should wear as MPs. Now, in 1919, men in Parliament still wore full morning suit. Now, of course, that wasn't available to Nancy Astor and the other early women. And so Nancy Astor decided to create a, a uniform, as it were, for the early women MPs. And she wore a black skirt and jacket, a white blouse, a tricorn hat, and a gardenia in her buttonhole. And she encouraged other women to dress uh, similarly. Uh, she wasn't best pleased with Ellen Wilkinson when she was elected in 1924 and turned up to Parliament wearing an emerald green dress. And Nancy encouraged her to dress more soberly, but to no avail. But there was also the question of whether women should wear hats or not in the Commons. And I'm just going to read a short passage from the book. There was also the persistent hat question. The usual convention in public meetings was that women showed their respects by their heads being covered. Before Astor took her seat, the Times speculated that no doubt she will wear her hat in the House, as she would do in church or chapel. But, it asked, if she wears a hat, should she remove it when she rises to speak, as male MPs are bound to do? 
It was a dilemma permeated with a sense of annoyance that the rules of the chamber were being challenged by the inappropriateness of the presence of women. A Daily Express headline screamed, hat problem still unsolved. <laughs> It remained unsolved well into the 1920s. In 1929, the Labour MP Susan Lawrence's usual sobriety saw a brief interlude when, wishing to speak but having no hat with her, she placed an order paper over her head. The Speaker ruled that in future, women could remain uncovered when speaking in the chamber. The hat problem, at least, was settled. And that was a full 10 years after the first woman took her seat. I've already mentioned Ellen Wilkinson briefly, briefly, but Ellen Wilkinson was one of those MPs, a socialist and a feminist, first elected in 1924, who really wanted to shake up Parliament, and she wasn't going to abide by any of the conventions that Nancy Astor or the men in Parliament were going to set. Uh, she wore the emerald green dress, but also she challenged some of the unwritten rules about where women were allowed to go in the House of Commons. And the smoking room, which still exists in Parliament today, although you can't smoke in it, uh, was barred in the 1920s to even women MPs. And Nancy Astor walked up to the door to walk in, and the policeman on the door said, excuse me, ma'am, but ladies are not usually allowed in here. And she said, I am not a lady, I am a member of parliament, and walked into the smoking room. But Ellen Wilkinson was also just four foot 11 in height, and when she was appointed to the cabinet by Clement Attlee to be education secretary in 1945, and expected to make her debut speech from the dispatch box, she realized that she wasn't tall enough to see over the dispatch box. And so for her speeches, she had to stand next to it uh, rather than in front of it. Another example, I think, of how parliament was very much built for men, as a debating chamber for men, uh, not for women. This book obviously speaks about a lot of the firsts. I mentioned Nancy Astor and uh, Wilkinson. It speaks about Margaret Bonfield, who 90 years ago this year was the first ever woman to serve in a British cabinet. And in many ways, she too was a very unlikely member of parliament. She was born the 10th of 11 children uh, in Chard in Somerset. And uh, she left school at 14, she grew up in poverty, and she moved to Brighton, where she was the uh, assistant to a tailor there. And um, she joined the Shop Workers' Union because of her experience of poverty, both growing up in Somerset, but also the poverty pay and the exploitation in the workplace that she experienced in Brighton. And she rose to be the assistant secretary of her union. She was the first woman ever to speak at Trades Union Congress, the first Labour woman to be elected to Parliament in 1923, and in 1929, uh, as Minister for Labour, she was the first uh, woman to serve in a cabinet. The book speaks about Margaret Thatcher, and in many ways, for me, that was the, the hardest bit of the book uh, to write. Um, I was an early convert to the Labour cause, uh, and when I was growing up, I disagreed with almost everything that Margaret Thatcher uh, was doing. But when I came to write this book, I also reflected on the fact that when I was growing up, I never doubted that a woman could lead or be prime minister because we saw her there doing just that. And so I speak about Margaret Thatcher and her experience of getting selected to be a Conservative candidate in the first place. And she went for many selections before she was finally selected in Finchley and Golders Green. And at one of the selection meetings in Maidstone, the feedback from the local Conservative Association was that she would make a very good MP, but she hadn't thought sufficiently about how she was going to combine being a mother and a member of Parliament. And you just can't imagine a man being told that he hadn't given sufficient thought of how he was going to combine being a father and a member of parliament. The book talks about uh, Betty Boothroyd, who once said that she should be in the Guinness Book of Records for the number of failures, because she went for so many selections and stood so many times for parliament before she was eventually successful in West Bromwich. And the book also talks about Diane Abbott, the first black woman to be elected to parliament in 1987, just 32 um, years ago, and she speaks about her experience along with Paul Boateng and Bernie Grant of constantly uh, being um, challenged in Parliament to produce their identification, to explain why they were there, because so many people could not believe that she was there as a black woman serving as a member of Parliament. And sadly, when I interviewed uh, uh, MPs past and present for this book, 
that story came up time and time again from women MPs, uh, and particularly from, uh, from black women uh, serving in Parliament. Dawn Butler, who's Labour's um, Women and Equality spokesman uh, today, was first elected in 2005, and she was mistaken once as a cleaner in the House of Commons. And uh, you just can't imagine a white man, or indeed a white woman, uh, being mistaken as a cleaner in the House of Commons, but that was her experience uh, just 10 or so years ago. But the book also talks about the issues that women in Parliament have put on the political agenda and where they've delivered uh, change. Nancy Astor, when she was first elected, received two or 3,000 letters a week from women around the country who regarded Astor as their MP. They believed that only Nancy Astor in Parliament could understand their concerns, uh, and, and they wrote to her to, to ask her to put things right. Ellen Wilkinson once said that she sometimes felt like she was a member of Parliament for widows rather than a member of Parliament for Middlesbrough because she proposed a series of amendments to government legislation on widows' pensions and then received letters from women up and down the country asking her to take up their causes. The first piece of what was described as feminist legislation was passed in the mid-1920s, and the sponsor of that legislation was Margaret Wintringham, the second woman to take her seat in Parliament, and that was on the equal guardianship of children. And up until the mid-1920s, in, in the case of separation or divorce, children were the property of the father, and a woman had no rights over their child whatsoever. And, and that changed in the mid-1920s with that legislation sponsored by Margaret Wintringham, but supported by Nancy Astor and the other women uh, in Parliament. One of the people who I think is a real unsung uh, hero in, uh, who I talk about a lot in this book is Eleanor Rathbone. And Eleanor Rathbone was um, an independent member of Parliament in the 1920s until the mid-1940s. And her cause and, uh, and the issue that she put on the table and then uh, uh, succeeded in changing was the issue of... Um, of family allowances. And again, I'm just going to read a, a short extract from the book on, on that. Rathbone utilised her political power to campaign for family allowances, weekly payments made directly to mothers to help them provide food and clothing for their children. It was a recognition that they bore the burden of most childcare and that that work ought to be remunerated with an income. For Rathbone, this signified the idea of treating each family as though every man, woman and child in it had a separate stomach to be filled, back to be clothed, individuality to be developed and respected. Paying family allowances directly to the mother amounted to a kind of remuneration for the work that they did in the home. But despite Rathbone's best efforts, the government bill published in February 1945 made the allowance payable to the father, although either could technically cash the allowance. The Conservative Chancellor, Rab Butler, defended the decision, stating it is not the business of the government to resolve differences within the family. But in the final debate in the Commons, the women MPs, Eleanor Rathbone, Edith Summerskill, Mavis Tate and Nancy Astor, all spoke in favour of payment to the, to the mother, with Rathbone even threatening to vote against the bill without the amendment. If this bill goes through in its present form, I cannot vote for the third reading, although I have worked for this thing for over 25 years. It would be one of the bitterest disappointments of my political life if it did not go through. In the end, family allowances were a victory for the independence of women. The first family allowance payments were made to mothers in August 1946, eight months after Rathbone died. And that is a battle that women had to fight because men didn't understand, the men in Parliament did not understand why it mattered that that money went directly to the women. And it was a battle that had to be fought over and over again. When Barbara Castle proposed a system of child benefits in the 1960s, again, the Labour Treasury argued it would be much simpler to pay it to the main earner and not the main carer. When Gordon Brown proposed a system of tax credits, it took Harriet Harman, uh, Lorna Fitzsimons and Yvette Cooper to go as a delegation to Gordon Brown and the Treasury and make the case once again that they should be paid to the main carer and not the main earner. It was one on all three of those occasions, but the most recent change to the benefit system with universal credit is now a benefit that is paid to the main earner and not the main carer, a redistribution from women towards men and one which I think is profoundly wrong. 
The issue of equal pay will forever be associated with Barbara Castle, and rightly so, and the work she did with the uh, Dagenham Ford workers. But equal pay, again, um, had supporters from across the political spectrum. Again, I'll just read a short extract. Women MPs taking a stance on equal pay was not new. In 1944, the Conservative MP, Thelma Castellet Kia, had tabled a successful equal pay amendment against her, only, her own government, only for it to be quashed by Winston Churchill in a confidence vote. Whilst previous governments had paid lip service of the idea of equal pay for women, action had been confined to the civil service. In principle, equal pay had been a TUC objective ever since the Match Girls strike in 1888, but it was far from a priority. Yet even in the 1960s and 70s, equal pay faced opposition from both Labour and the Conservatives. Essentially, both parties believed that equal pay was desirable, but that it could wait until the economic situation was suitable. The Labour MP, Lena Jager, disagreed, stating, the more equal pay costs, the more has been women's compulsory subsidy to the wages bill of this country over the years. The internal equal pay debate within Labour was encapsulated by a debate between Barbara Castle and Jenny Lee. Lee thought that until the men's wages had reached sufficient levels, the notion of equal pay for equal work was futile. Barbara, we cannot ask for equal pay when miners' wages are so low, she pleaded. In that case, we will wait forever, Barbara Castle responded. So that was a debate that wasn't as straightforward as perhaps those of us on the left would like to believe with the Conservatives arguing against it and Labour for it. There was a battle within the Labour Party on the left, but also there were Conservative MPs, including Thelma Castle key and others, who were willing to vote against their own government to secure equal pay. I argue in this book that all of our lives, particularly the lives of women, have been impacted in some way by the women who have served in Parliament over the last 100 years. And I believe that that impact has been profoundly positive. Of course, there are still challenges and battles to fight and overcome. Despite the equal pay legislation 50 years ago next year, women are still paid 18% less than men. There are still far too few women on the boards of our companies. Women are more likely to be the victims of domestic violence, and women, particularly pensioners and mothers, are more likely to be in poverty than men. But in all these areas, on equal pay, on family allowances and child benefit, on domestic violence, and on childcare, it's been women who have put these issues on the political agenda, made them mainstream issues, and ensured that change has come on the statute book. I believe also that as a woman in Parliament today, I'm standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before me. And the campaigning work of so many women over the decades has made it a little bit easier for my generation of women in Parliament today. I don't think that it's any surprise that the first four women who were appointed to the Cabinet, none of them had children and only one of them, Barbara Castle, was married. Indeed, the first woman to serve in a cabinet who was a mother was Judith Hart, who was appointed by Harold Wilson in the late 1960s. And I interviewed her son, Steve Hart, for the book, and he said he was the first child who was able to say to his school friends, my mother is in the cabinet. The first woman to have a baby while serving as a member of parliament was Helen Heyman in 1976. And politically, there couldn't have been a worse time to have a child. Uh, Labour's majority was wafer thin, and she was a Labour MP. And it was falling in a series of by-elections. And pairing had been suspended. And so just 10 days after she gave birth, she was back in, the parli back in parliament, leaving her baby in the whip's office while she spent the evening walking through the division lobbies to take part in crucial debates. Because of the work of her and Harriet Harman and Joan Ruddock and others, the hours of Parliament have now been reformed, so we very rarely now sit all through the night. And earlier this year, on the 29th of January, the first woman MP voted by proxy, nominating another MP to vote on their behalf because they had recently had a baby. So there's been big reform in the last 100 years. And I believe that that reform in so many areas has been led by the women who I speak about in this book. My purpose of this book was to rewrite some of these fantastic women back into our political history, but also, I hope, to inspire a future generation of young people, and particularly young women, to put themselves forward for public service and political office. And I hope that it does that. Thank you.
Rachel, um, uh, thank you. That was fascinating. And the book is very illuminating. Um, uh, you've got a perspective that, having done your research, and you yourself now being uh, an MP for a number of years, and you're quite young, if I may say that, and you have young children, and the, the difficulties that are present to particularly women, I'm not excluding men who are also bringing up children, but particularly to women, are significant. So the antisocial hours, um, how you sort out childcare, um, and including um, online abuse. And I, I know you wrote in the book because y you're, you're a friend or were a friend of Joe Cox, weren't you? Because you're both uh, MPs in, in Leeds, is that right? Or in North Yorkshire, West Yorkshire. Yorkshire, West yeah. Yorkshire. Um, and there was one um, thing that I read was uh, about how in terms of online abuse, and this is a particularly, well, it is a 21st century phenomenon. Um, she received five times as much online abuse as fellow Labour MP N Neil Coyle after they wrote an article together. And this disproportionality just seems to be a pervading theme. Yes, absolutely. I, um, maybe I'll take that in, in, in two parts, really. I, I had my children in 2013 and 2015, so um, I was first elected in, in 2010. And, you know, this was before the proxy voting had been introduced. And we still don't have maternity leave in Parliament. And proxy voting is one thing, but voting is only one part of an, an MP's job. And I remember when I had my first child in, in 2013, um, you know, my voting record in Parliament was blank um, for, you know, for a few months whilst I was um, uh, um, off with my, uh, my young daughter. And the campaigning group, 38 Degrees, um, wrote to my constituents uh, with an email entitled, Where is Rachel Reeves? And they, um, they said that I had missed a crucial vote in, in Parliament. Now, I was paired for that vote, so I was cancelled out by a Conservative MP who also wasn't voting, but they hadn't bothered to check their facts, and they were suggesting to my uh, constituents that I wasn't a hard-working uh, MP. Now, one of my constituents responded to them and, and, and said why I wasn't there, but the fact is that your voting record is blank if you are not there in Parliament, which is why proxy voting is so important. In 2015, um, when I had my second um, child, I was, um, I was in the shadow cabinet, um, and it was the general election in, in, in 2015, and I did an interview um, with a newspaper, and I, I said that um, if, um, if Ed Miliband won the general election and I was appointed as work and pension secretary, which was my job in opposition, um, that the first thing that I would do would be to get rid of the bedroom tax, and I would do it before I went on um, maternity leave um, later that year. A Conservative MP called Andrew Rosendale then um, um, gave a quote to the Daily Mail that said that if Ed Miliband became Prime Minister, he shouldn't appoint me to his cabinet. Uh, I've never been entirely clear what his issue was, but I think he thought that it would be too difficult to combine being a new mother uh, with a big job. But both, um, well, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair and David Cameron all had new babies whilst they were in number 10. I don't remember anyone suggesting that they should stand down from being Prime Minister because, you know, screaming children and changing nappies wasn't conducive with holding a big, big political um, office. But somehow for, for a woman that wouldn't be possible, but for a man it, it would be. So, you know, I did come up against, um, against that when I was an MP and this idea that, you know, you can't have it all, you can't do both. Um, which I just don't think that men get. The, the is issue of abuse is something that has changed hugely. And, you know, so much of the book is about progress. Uh, but uh, the area where we've gone backwards is the abuse that women, particularly in public life, um, receive. And, and certainly at the 2017 general election, the abuse that women received was off the scale compared with um, the abuse that men were getting on, online. And the problem is, and we saw it, you know, with what happened to Joe, um, that that abuse online quickly spills over into the real world. There's obviously a man in prison for the murder of Joe, but there's also a man in prison for the attempted, um, for, 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 for plotting to kill the Labour MP, um, Rosie Cooper. Um, there are, I think, three or four people who have served prison sentences for death threats against Luciana Berger. And the abuse that, that Diane Abbott gets as a black woman, uh, again, you know, totally uh, it totally um, outstrips anything that anyone else uh, gets. So if you are a, a black or a minority ethnic woman in parliament, or if you are a, um, um, a, a Jewish um, woman in parliament, the abuse that you get is just off, this, uh, off the scale. And I really worry that um, 
all the progress that has been made to where we are now with almost a third of our um, MPs women, that, that that is very fragile. And you'll only continue to make progress if women are willing to put themselves forward. And if this sort of abuse and the polluting of the political debate continues, I do worry about people not wanting to put themselves forward. Diane Abbott, when I interviewed her for my book, um, said that lots of women, young women, come and do work experience for her in, uh, in Hackney and in Parliament. And she says at the beginning of the week or the fortnight, they say, one day I'd love to do your job, Diane. And at the end of that week or fortnight, they say, I'm really pleased you do what you do, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't put up with what you have to put up with on a daily basis. Um, the, Theresa May, when I interviewed her for the book, said, you used to have the bloke who sat at the end of the bar muttering into his pint, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone just thought he was a bit weird. And now he puts stuff on social media and builds up a following, and in that echo chamber, it becomes normal to say what you're saying. And it gives it more legitimacy when people share it and like it. Uh, and I do worry about how we conduct ourselves in public life and what sort of people in the future are going to put themselves forward if part of the job description is putting up with what people have to put up with today. Have you had to put up more? Yeah. <laughs> have you had to build more barriers yourself, both internally and externally? How have you dealt with that personally? You absolutely do. Um, I, uh, you know, there are times when I will not use Twitter myself. I have to make sure I've got a profile. So I will you know, say to my, my team in Leeds and in, in Westminster, you know, can you put something out about this? Can you clip a video of what I did in the chamber yesterday and put it out? But I don't look at it because it's corrosive and it does damage you. However strong you are to see this stuff all the time, it does get to you. And I interviewed Brendan Cox, um, uh, for the book, and I've become good friends with Joe's sister, Kim, since her murder. And, you know, Joe often just would not use social media uh, because it was, it was just too corrosive. Uh, the other change that myself and other, lots of other people do now is we won't say on social media, really looking forward to going to so-and-so community centre today, or really looking forward to visiting the Something Festival in my constituency today. After the event, we'll say where we've been, but the police say, don't say where you're going because you're putting yourself at risk. But, you know, what sort of politics have we got where the police advise you not to say where you're going to be in your own constituency? Uh, but, you know, that's how, you know, that's how we're expected now. And our police say to us, our local police forces, if there's anything you're worried about, we'll come to your surgeries, we'll come to your events. But it's not how our politics should be done. And Joe wouldn't have wanted us to, you know, put a barrier between ourselves and our constituents. But we also have to think about our families. And, you know, Jess Phillips, I think, when I interviewed her, said that sometimes when she goes down to Westminster on a Sunday evening or a Monday morning, her children will say, do you have to go? Because our children worry about our safety. My children are too young to understand this, but it's something I will have to contend with in the future That's as well. That's what I was well. going to ask you, whether there have been moments, um, I mean, you first left in 2010, so it's nine years now, whether there have been any moments where you've thought, seriously, there must be moments when you think, oh, no, why have I done this? But seriously thought, I can't do this for the sake of my marriage, for the sake of my children. It wasn't like this in 2010 when I was elected. Um, I used Facebook when I was elected, started using Twitter shortly after. Um, but the last few years, the last three years, really, um, possibly four, um, things have just got much worse. Um, you know, I, if, if you give in, the problem is is if you give in, then they've won, haven't they? And you know, the, the, the book is about women who dared to speak out and be brave and put themselves forward, often to be ridiculed, to be marginalized by their own political parties. I mean, one of the wonderful things um, that, I, that I came across time and time again in the book is women working across the political spectrum to mm. achieve change. And that often happened, especially in the early years, because women were ostracized and marginalized by their own parties. And so they found friendship and, uh, uh, and comradeship amongst women from across the political spectrum. And you still see that in Parliament um, today. Uh, and you know, we support each other, uh, including, again, across the political spectrum. But I'm not going to, you know, to, to stand down or to stop speaking out for what I believe in, uh, because otherwise, what would be the point and what would be the purpose? So I carry on fighting. Uh, and standing up for what I believe in, but I do worry about, as I say, you know, the future of our politics. If part of the job description is 
to put up with this. That sense of collegiality really does come across strongly uh, right the way through the book. Um, and cross-party working, which I think, um, given the current political situation we are, we just seem to be more polarized. Yeah. Is that too much of a gender stereotype that you know men are polarized and, and women are not and are work more consensually? Yeah. I think in the early years, there were so many issues that, you know, whether you were a Labour or Conservative or, uh, uh, or a Liberal in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, you know, whichever party you were in, as a woman, you were going to care about some of these issues, equal guardianship, widows' pensions, uh, equal pay, family allowances. And so you had women working together to put these issues on the uh, agenda. And Margaret Wintering, in the debate about family, uh, about um, equal guardianship of children, asked the men in the House of Commons to do a mental somersault and put themselves in the position where they desperately desired the custody of their own child but were denied it. And that was a woman ap appealing to the men to put themselves in the shoes of a mother. Uh, and the women from all parties, they didn't have to do that mental somersault because that was their experience or the experience of people they knew. Uh, and so I think it was more inevitable in those early years. But still today, whether it's issues about um, abortion reform in, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, the changes uh, on domestic violence legislation and, and coercive control, you still today often see women working together across the political spectrum. Again, coming back to Jo Cox, in, in her maiden speech, we all now uh, know, she said, we have more in common than that which divides us. And, and when she said that, she was speaking about, um, primarily about her constituency in Batley and Spen. Um, but actually, it, it personified her whole approach to politics. And when she was elected, she sought out MPs in other political parties to work together because she believed, and I think she's right, that the way you achieve lasting change is to find people who you might not always agree with um, to build a consensus and try and find a common good. And so on issues around Syria, the protection of civilians in, in war zones, and on the issue of loneliness, she found MPs from the Conservative Party to work together with. And one of the things that I'm most proud of having done in Parliament was to, to take on Joe's work, working with the Conservative MP Seema Kennedy uh, to set up the Joe Cox Commission on Loneliness after Joe died. And look, I've got to say, when I was elected in 2010, I was incredibly tribal. But my experiences of the nine, last nine years, and particularly of the last uh, three or four, is that actually Joe was totally right. We do have more in common. And actually, if you can find areas to work together and build consensus, you'll get better policy making and a better politics. And I would like to see more of that in our parliament and in our public life and debate. I think we'd all agree with that. Thank you, Rachel. I'm sure that the audience have got plenty of comments or questions. What I'm going to do is, if you could put your uh, hand up, if there's anything that you would like to ask, um, I will then go around and number them so that we can have more than one at a time. I'm sweeping around to make sure. Um, it would be uh, that lady in the uh, sunglasses uh, at the back, that gentleman in the check shirt, um, uh, red and white check shirt, and then there was somebody else from here? Lady in the front, um, uh, number three, thank you. So wait until the mic comes to you. Uh, so if that lady at the back first, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rachel. I've really enjoyed your talk. Um, lots to build on, but it still feels like we've an awful long way to go. Um, I've seen other people telling similar stories, like Harry Gracie and Mary Portis, about trying to get women's voices amplified in places of power. Um, and I agree completely with all three of you that it's about women working together to support other women. I'm just struck by the fact that um, we talk so much about the abuse being dealt out to women who dare to speak up, and I, it almost feels like a diversionary tactic. So the, the focus of the conversation becomes about that and how individual women are dealing with it, rather than actually finding a way to stop it happening, to silence the critics, mm -hmm. and to change the power structures so that women are not being exposed to this. So I wondered, with that, but also in a wider sense, what is the biggest couple of things we could be focusing on doing to elevate women's um, rise to more powerful positions so we can make more positive changes to enable more people to come after? Mm. Do you want to answer that and then... We'll yeah, okay, great. Um, 
so I, I think there's a lot more that the social media companies could do to uh, to crack down on, on some of the um, abuse. And Yvette Cooper uh, has done a lot of work o o on this. Um, but you know, it, it takes too long for for the social media companies to take down abuse. And this isn't just about the abuse of, of politicians. It goes much wider uh, than that. And I believe that they should take their responsibility as publishers of this to take responsibility for what is published on their um, platforms. I also think, you know, again. I don't want to keep coming back to the sort of morbid issue of, of, of Joe's murder, but after Joe um, was killed, there was a lot of um, stuff, people saying, you know, you're my MP and I want to say thank you for what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying you should like go around spending all your time, you know, being nice to, to MPs, um, but um, uh, <laughs> That'll never I, happen. <laughs> there is a lot, <laughs> there is a lot to criticise us for at the moment. Um, but some of that, you know, calling out the abuse on, on social media, you know, Again, I think it was Jess who described it to me that you'll have, um, you'll have, if, if someone, if you say something, and you'll have all these people coming down on you, uh, and they also then will attack somebody who stands up for you to try and stop them from doing it again. Uh, and it's about then, you know, being brave enough to come in behind people and stand up for what you know we all believe, what we believe in. Um, also, there's a great initiative set up called Ask Her to Stand, uh, and all the evidence shows that, um, you know, and again, and Theresa May spoke about this when I interviewed her. She set up Women to Win in the Conservative Party uh, because she saw the Labour benches looking increasingly like the country it was supposed to serve, and her party in 1997, when she was elected, having so few women. Uh, and Ask Her to Stand is about, you know, saying to women, you know, have you ever thought about standing for your council? Uh, as a member of parliament, you've got a huge amount to, uh, to offer. And when I interviewed Theresa May, she said, uh, I asked her why she set up um, um, Women to Win in the Conservative Party. She said, well, the problem is, um, in fact, it was the day after Boris Johnson had done that piece in the Telegraph where he said that Muslim women resembled post boxes. Um, and she said to me, Theresa May said to me, the problem is men, they all think they're the best, don't they? And women, they don't. They think they're in competition. And so we've got to tell women and encourage them to put themselves forward. And I, when she said the men, oh, they will think they're the best, don't they? I thought, I can guess what you're talking about, you know? Uh, and I think that is a tendency. It's not just in the Conservative Party. It's in, you know, I think all of our, our parties. So, you know, encouraging women who you think could do it to put themselves forward. And maybe not just in politics as well, you know, in whatever walk of life, to go for that promotion, to take on that extra responsibility at work, to believe in themselves and to, and, and to come in behind them. Thank you. Gentlemen. Yes, um, I just wondered, what sort of percentage of the abuse that you and your female colleagues get comes from men and from women? It's difficult to tell, you know, because um, most people who um, who do this abuse um, don't really identify themselves on on social media. So you know, you can't tell who they actually are behind their uh, you know their Twitter handle name. Um, I, I expect that most of it does come from fr from men. Some of it is um, you know uh, all automated through bots. Um, but you know, there's no denying that women also attack uh, uh, women. Uh, but I think most of it is. You know, why do m women receive a disproportionate amount of this abuse? Because a lot of people don't like women with strong opinions and want to silence them. And I expect that there are more men who don't like women having strong opinions than, than other women. But, you know, I, I don't know that for certain. You don't want to come back on that. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, wait, can you get the microphone again? Well, yes, I just would imagine most of it comes from men. Um, and one is always struck by the cowardice because they hide behind yeah. uh, pseudonyms, nom de plume or whatever. Um, but yeah, and, and most of them will not be well-adjusted individuals, I doubt. <laughs> Lady at the front. Rachel, thank you very much. Can't wait to read the, the book. Um, my question is about women at the top. We've had Mrs. Thatcher and we've had Mrs. May. I don't want to comment on how well they've done the job, but I wondered why we haven't got anyone at the top of the Labour Party. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is the question I asked uh, of, of all the women um, Labour MPs, past and present, who I interviewed for the book. Uh, Margaret Hodge's answer uh, was the most um, to the point. She said, 
because we're absolutely bloody sexist, Rachel. Um, and I think there is some element of I think there is some element of truth to that. The Labour Party is still a very male-dominated party amongst our membership. All women shortlists have had uh, a hugely positive effect in changing the parliamentary Labour Party. So almost half of Labour MPs now are women. But when you don't use all women shortlists in the Labour Party, time and time again, we elect men to the top jobs. Uh, and so obviously now we have a male leader, deputy leader, all Labour's directly elected mayors are men. And of course, the leader of, of Scottish Labour and Welsh Labour uh, are also men. Uh, and I think the Labour Party, who prides itself of being the party of women's rights and equality, need to look a little bit more at ourselves and ask that question uh, and, and to work out how we can ensure when there's another, when the f there's a future leadership contest, that the next leader is a woman, because I think it would be a source of huge shame to the Labour Party if the next time we elect a leader, we elect another man. And Harriet Harman makes that point, doesn't she? In the yes. Afterword of the book. <laughs> uh, yes, Harriet um, has kindly wrote the afterword to the, this book, and um, I had a very long interview. Um, with her, um, she's incredibly generous with her, her time. She's done you know, more than most women actually to transform the Labour Party, but actually to transform Parliament as a, as a whole. Uh, she said that the men should sit out the next leadership of the uh, l um, contest of the Labour Party. Uh, I put that uh, suggestion, suggestion to Jess Phillips and Angela Eagle, and they <laughs> both said, I wouldn't hold your breath, Rachel. <laughs> uh, but as, as you say, there are some really talented uh, women, both on the front bench of the Labour Party and on the back benches, and I, I really hope that our, our next leader is a woman. It is well past time, well past time. And Harriet, uh, Harriet Harman was uh, passed over, really, wasn't she, when she was in uh, in the cabinet? I can't remember what position she was holding. Well, she, Harriet was uh, deputy uh, uh, leader under Gordon and then under um, uh, Ed Miliband. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I'm not sure if she would go quite as far as saying it, but I think she does regret you know, not having stood uh, for the leadership herself. But it's a little bit like, actually, that the first question we were asked. You know, all of us women should have come behind Harriet and said, you know, why don't you, you're the most experienced woman in the cabinet, why don't you go for it? You're the most experienced person in the cabinet, you've been deputy, why don't you go for it? And I interviewed um, Margaret Beckett for the book as well, who was um, the first woman to serve as deputy leader of the Labour Party under John Smith. And um, she stood then for the leadership and the deputy leadership after John Smith uh, died. She lost leadership to Tony Blair and she lost the deputy leadership to John Prescott. And she said she remembered being at the conference when Blair and Prescott went onto the stage, anointed as a new leader and deputy leader, and then they were joined on the stage by their wives. And uh, she said to herself, normal service in the Labour Party has been resumed. Uh, and that was in 1994 and normal service still in the Labour Party is for the men to be in charge, and that's got to end. Definitely. Um, a lady there at the front, and um, a lady sitting at the back on the right, and then, have I got anybody? Oh, gentleman here at the, at the front. I'll come over to you if I can, if we have time. Thank you very much, Rachel. As a woman born in 1955, I feel very angry about what has happened with my state pension. And the only person that I feel has really tried to campaign about this is Baroness Ross, Ross Altman. And I wonder why women MPs are not doing more about it. Okay. Well, I was shadow pensions minister in 2000. You need to uh, perhaps put that yeah. in context. So this is the, the change in the state pension uh, age uh, for, for women born in the, in the mid-1950s. In 2011, changes were uh, brought forward to bring forward to, to, to put back the uh, the age at which women got the state pension with very little uh, notice a period, less than 10 years to plan. And the savings of, 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 of women from that generation are something like just 10% of the savings of men because so many women have taken time out of the labour market uh, to care for children and then often later in life to care for elderly um, parents. I was shadow pensions minister in 2011. Ian Duncan Smith was uh, work and pension secretary and Steve Webb, the Liberal Democrat, was the pension Pensions Minister. Uh, and as Shadow Pensions Minister, I, I led the opposition to that. And we got some concessions. So it was, uh, um, it was no woman had to wait more than 18 uh, months, uh, whereas previously it was, uh, it was two years. And I, I'm proud 
of getting those changes, but they did not go uh, far enough, as, as you suggest. Uh, certainly in, in Parliament, I, when I was Shadow Pensions Minister, but then previous, uh, then successive um, um, uh, Labour and SNP MPs have, have led that campaign. And I worked with um, Ros, Ros Altman uh, when I was Shadow Pensions uh, Minister. Uh, those changes now, uh, you know, are, are, are going ahead. You are probably now still waiting for your uh, uh, state pension. And I, and I know that, um, you know, I, I thought it was wrong at the time. I still believe it is, is wrong. The uh, Pensions Commission, um, under the last Labour government, said that any changes to the state pension age has to give uh, people at least 10 years to prepare for those changes. Uh, um, and, and, and I still believe that, that that should be the case and, you know, have argued against those changes. I think it's not fair to say that uh, MPs haven't been involved in that. There's been a number of debates uh, in the chamber and lots of questions to successive secretaries of state on that. But in the end, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, when they were in the coalition government, uh, um, rejected uh, those pleas to think again. Thank you. Lady over there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question. In the United States, I've seen women senators talk, and they seem very sane. But then when it comes to a vote, there's a lot of pressure on them to vote with their party. And I was wondering if that was the same here, where sometimes somebody votes against their conscience in order to vote with the majority in their party. I think that this parliament, the, at the moment, is probably one of the most rebellious parliaments that, ever um, uh, on both the Labour and the Conservative um, uh, side. You know, when I was first elected in 2010, I, I, to be honest, you know, I was a real Labour loyalist. I, I couldn't have imagined voting against my um, my party. But on the issue of Europe, I have voted against my party because I'm very um, much against leaving the Euro European Union, and uh, I want a, a second referendum. And I want to remain. And I've tried to push my leadership to go further in that um, that cause. So I I have rebelled against my my own party, which I couldn't have imagined when I was first elected doing that. Um, but on the Conservative Party as well, you've had very brave MPs uh, who have resigned from, from government, who have refused to take positions in government, uh, and you know who will even consider voting um, no confidence in their own prime minister. So I think this parliament, for all sorts of reasons, I think partly because every vote really matters, the, the government now have, you know, effectively a you know, majority of just um, you know, one or two, um, the, every vote matters. And so you know, if you're going to go along with your party, you will affect the, the end vote. And, and so for that reason, and also because you know, never more has there been an issue that is well beyond parties. You know, the issue of Brexit goes well beyond what political party you sign up to. And it will have, uh, it will have consequences well beyond any parliament. And so I think that uh, amongst men and women, this has been a very rebellious parliament. One of the things that people have commented on a lot is the lack of leadership, political leadership at the moment, or perceived, uh, perhaps I should say, lack of leadership. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Because um, <laughs> Theresa May has been one sort of political leader. Uh, some would say, I mean, I, I did have to acknowledge the fact that you credited her. I, I had almost written her out because of mo her more recent lack of achievements, in my opinion. Um, but actually, she did an awful lot. She was more in the model, it seems to me, although there are very different personalities of Margaret Thatcher. Um, does it require a different form of leadership for females to be successful? Um, because those two are very different to the sort of collegiate approach that you were talking about. I, I interviewed Theresa May for the book, and you know when I spoke to her about what she did as, as Home Secretary. Now, I mean, there's a lot of things as Home Secretary I would profoundly disagree with, particularly on um, immigration, but um, on the issues of, of modern-day slavery and human trafficking and, uh, and grooming of, of young girls. Uh, you know, she did a lot, and she does really care about those issues. And, and also, she has helped transform the Conservative Party, so you have so many more women. Um, um, MPs today on the Conservative benches, and she should take a large amount of the, the credit um, for, for those um, reforms. I mean, you know, but I can still disagree with, with her on, on, on other issues, and, you know, I voted against you know, her deal on however many times it came back to the House of Commons, and, and, and thought that she was taking us on the, on, in the wrong direction. Um, 
you know, although, to be honest, compared to what the new leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister is doing, uh, you know, bring back she Theresa May. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't think I'd ever say that. Um, so, you know, look, she tried. She tried to do her best. But she was dealt an impossible hand. Mm. She she made some really bad calls early on. Uh, the you know Brexit means Brexit, red, white, and blue Brexit. Um, uh, you know th they were they, they were they were big mistakes. And saying we were going to leave the single market and customs union, and and not then reconsidering her position and our position after she lost her majority in the 2017 general election. You know, they were profound mistakes, but within the constraints that she created, I, I do believe she tried to do, to do her best. I suppose my, my question is more about um, the wider issue of, of leadership, and is it that, does it go back to that issue that you mentioned earlier about women being uh, slightly less confident? I think it's generally accepted that women are lower, have lower self-esteem than many men. And that there are, in fact, incredibly talented women in Parliament today who could be potential leaders, but there's still that sort of sense of, can I do this? You know, I think there's a, there's a demand issue and there's a supply issue. So when women put themselves forward, like um, you know Margaret uh, Beckett, uh, Yvette Cooper, uh, Liz Kendall, they don't get elected. Um, to be to be leaders in the Labour Party, and, and then there's also the supply issue. People don't want to put themselves forward, like Harriet Harman, because she didn't think that she that, that was the job that she could do for whatever reason. So I think there are both of those issues, which is I guess again coming back to that that earlier point. You know, what are we all doing to to, to, to nurture that talent to ensure that you know that future generation are there? Look, if there was a you know, when there is a, a future leadership contest in the Labour Party, I have no doubt that there'll be lots of women who put themselves forward. There is a very strong feeling that uh, this is our time and and we need a woman um, uh, leader. And uh, you have the same thing in the US where you've got so many women putting themselves forward for the Democrat nomination uh, for uh, for president, and that's a great thing. Uh, and so I think that that that, that confidence issue and that willing to put yourself forward, I think that that's improving. And because there are now so many more women in Parliament, uh, you know, you have got that, you know, you've got a and, and also you've got that solidarity within Parliament. There's something called, um, we call it donutting in Parliament. If you're making a big speech and you're, you know, a bit anxious about it, you will message your friends and you'll tell them to come into the chamber and to donut you so they sit around you. <laughs> uh, and it is almost always, you know, your women friends. And, you know, Harriet Harman and Helen Heyman and Margaret Beckett, and, you know, and to be fair, Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher, they didn't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, when they were elected, there were so few women to, to donut them. But now there are these really strong support structures in Parliament of women supporting women. And um, Jackie Smith, the first um, woman Home Secretary, spoke about this when I interviewed her. She had her... Um, first child, I think it was, just after she was elected in 1997. And she said on Monday evenings, the other women MPs would, you know, come and collect her and gather her up and take her for dinner and try and take her out of herself because she really missed her children. Uh, and it was a real strong support structure, which, you know, the earlier generation of women just didn't have. That's why I say, you know, I'm standing on these women's shoulders and it's so much easier for my generation of women because of the battles that they fought. They reformed the hours, they in, we've introduced proxy voting. There's so many more of us there. You know, our challenges are still huge, but I, I, I think that we are walking a much, a much easier and steadier path because of their efforts. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more question. This gentleman here. Thank you very much for the conversation. It's been wonderful. And you rightly speak about how the number of women have risen in Parliament, but it's not enough yet. And I agree with that. But it is an interesting point that those with various disabilities are not really represented within Parliament at all. And I'd like you to comment on some of the decisions that are made around benefits. And do you think if someone like myself and others had the rightful place in the halls of power, that would change? Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And so many of the arguments I make in this book about having women in Parliament has put these issues on the agenda 
could equally be made about people with disabilities, people from black and minority um, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and I, I, what I would like to see is a, a parliament that looks more like the country that we're supposed to serve. And it doesn't today. It doesn't because there are still twice as many men there as women. It doesn't because parliament is still very white. It doesn't because you don't have people with, with, with disabilities in a way that re reflects the country we're supposed to uh, um, serve. And because, and you can't see it, but you can hear it and you know it, that parliament is incredibly privileged. And there are so many people who went to very expensive fee-paying schools uh, who have, uh, were born with every privilege and very few people still from working class backgrounds. And the problem is, is you're missing out on a huge amount of talent. If you're selecting from a, such a narrow pool, you're going to miss out on a huge amount of talent from every walk of life. But also, you're going to have issues neglected. Uh, there's no reason why men couldn't champion equal pay and family allowances. There's no reason why white MPs couldn't champion the Windrush generation or, um, or, or, or issues of, of, of disability rights. But the truth is, the, the experience really matters. And that's why I think it's so important that Parliament starts to look a bit more like the country it's meant to serve. A hundred years ago, every single member of Parliament was a man. When I was born, 40 years ago, there were 19 women in Parliament, and today there are about 210. You know, that's a huge change in my lifetime, and it has meant that legislation has been passed that has improved the lives of women across the country. And I hope that in my lifetime, in your lifetime, Parliament looks even more diverse and more like the country we're supposed to serve, because I think then you will have more talent in Parliament. I don't think anybody could deny that we need more talent in Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that it will put onto the agenda the issues that matter to all of our constituents. And my book is to try and rewrite some of the fantastic women back into history. Uh, but also, I think there's books to be written about how we can make Parliament more diverse in all these different ways. I think that's a... That's a, an excellent place to finish. Sadly, we've run out of time. I noticed that there were one or two um, uh, hands still up. So if you would like to uh, continue the conversation with Rachel, do join us in the gin tent, which I think is there. And hopefully, I'll be able to get you a gin and tonic. You never know. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, thank you to you, Rachel. And thank you to you, the audience. And I hope you've enjoyed it.